Hello. Hello. And Scott somewhere. Yeah. It's one past. Good morning. Did we lose Jerry? Hasn't shown up yet. Hmm. <clears throat> It's a very quiet group here. Welcome to our Thursday meditation center. <laughs> Awareness. <That's right. laughs> yeah. Well, Doug, I think we're finally kicking off this uh, this uh, audacious undertaking that you have been pushing us towards. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, we had uh, we, we are actually having meetings to uh, to set up an organizational construct that uh, that uh, will allow us to move forward with it. <clears throat> While we are waiting for Jerry, I have maybe a question of the people already here to kind of introduce themselves in two sentences so but that's impossible of course to tell who you are in two sentences but to kind of get an idea if that feels like something you want to do well you're raising the question speaks to a need so uh, okay i'm gonna jump in okay. uh mike uh, uh <laughs> I come from a psychoanalytic background. I studied with Eric Fromm. Uh, uh, Eric Erickson said the time has come to put society on the couch. I like that. Uh, my focus is on what I'm calling garden world politics. That is, the way to get to the future is to push issues together and work them simultaneously so that gardening, that is the making of food and habitat, ought to be in the same place, like the Italian hill towns. Uh, it's good for children, it's good for pets, it's good for old people, uh, and it's an attractive vision. Whether we actually have a space in the future to get there or not is the question. Uh, I think we're swamped by the tendency towards uh, a high-tech future to try and manage everything in an algorithmic way. Uh, I don't think it's gonna work. Uh, but I think we need to engage our imagination. So I think what I'm really doing is uh, trying to keep the imagination alive and trying for possibilities. Mm. Thanks. Bentley, you're unmuted. Did you want to go next? Uh, 
I can. <laughs> so Bentley Davis, software engineer, currently exper experimenting with a project called Gullybot, which helps uh, so society make decisions based on evidence uh, in a non combative way. And uh, I also started an OGME project uh, where I um, were crowd sort funding a, um, an open source uh, way for people to look at their Zoom chats a little easier. So it just takes the blob of text they give you and formats it in a nice way. Um, so um, I could put links to that stuff in the, in the Mattermost. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thomas, you oh. want to go next? Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a retired uh, food service professional and uh, have spent the last 10 years since my retirement to try to alert everyone that uh, we're about running out of time uh, to, uh, to call food because the way we're calling food is destroying the environment and is destroying the very foundation for uh, what it takes to call food. And we're finally reaching the point where this is becoming obvious for, to everyone because we, are, we have already lost 40% of our topsoil. You know, we're polluting our waters uh, and we're diminishing biodiversity that is necessary to sustain life itself. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm a core team member for the Sierra Club, Food and Act Team, Grassroots Network, um, I'm working with uh, Citizen Climate Lobby and Business Climate Leader, leader as, uh, uh, business, as a sector leader, agriculture. And then I finally got that entire group focused on food because it's clear you know, that uh, the IPCC targets cannot be met without uh, fixing food. It's imp if, you, if you stop the emissions today from uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, consumption in, in transportation and, and, and the energy sector, it wouldn't matter. You know, food alone would push us beyond uh, the two de degrees Celsius. Um, so, so now there is a very energized team. We're doing webinars. We are engaging over 200,000 citizen volunteers you know, to talk to members of Congress. To uh, we, we just uh, pushed the Coin Climate Solutions Act through, and we're working on other pieces of legislation, you know, to 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 get going. And here with OGM, we just agreed on uh, uh, setting up a very audacious plan to um, to develop a support structure to assist communities to to secure their food supply. Because at this point in time, I mean, if you look around globally. Uh, we are we are already in in a close to runaway uh, uh, changing climate. Um, basically, what what uh, has happened is that the uh, that the Arctic ice fields David, that the Arctic ice fields have shrunk to the point where they where they no longer have the capacity to energize the Gulf Stream. So the ocean currents and the air streams that have regulated our climate for thousands of years millions of years most likely, uh, are too weak now to, to, to uh, uh, keep weather patterns in place and move them around in time, which is why they are arrested in place. And at the same time, the air is holding so much more water because the climate is already uh, heated up. So you see these massive rainfalls coming down because there's just so much more moisture inside the air. And all of that means that our food supply is completely at risk. And so as a community, you have to protect yourself and you have to start alerting communities that they need to take ownership of their own ecosystem and their own environment. So that's what we're trying to do, uh, to set up a team to, to uh, bring attention to that, but then also um, function as an innovations brokerage to connect uh, need with support. Uh, to, to set up a platform where we can assist the community to identify its needs and then connect it with resources that can match that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, it, it's really helpful for me, but I'm not sure how it is for the rest of the call. I asked for introductions. 
and it's I, I like really hearing what people do as a fundamental drive or something. So unless somebody else wants to do something uh, uh, until Jerry might come <laughs> into the call. I, I like continuing. If you have an objection, please let me know. Um, so, yeah. OK, Michael. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do an introduction too, but I actually did have a question for Klaus. Maybe we can circle back to it. I don't know where we are in the introduction, introduction yeah. process because I got here a little bit late. Um, um, well, let me ask my question for Klaus. Just the, the um, you know, the, the bullet point of if um, the carbon emissions from the energy sector and, and fossil fuels, et cetera, disappeared, um, food, food systems would still be at issue. Is the opposite also true? Um, I mean, do, do, you know, is, is food enough by itself if carbon emissions and, uh, you know, and emissions from the energy sector were, sorry, not carbon emissions, uh, fossil fuel related and energy related climate emissions were eliminated, uh, were not eliminated and, and the food system was. Yeah, I, 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 I think I understand where you're trying to go. The, 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 the position we're in today is there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere. Right. If we have to pull it down, right? And then there are these hairbrained ideas. And, and I mean, I've been listening to presentations of people coming up with uh, uh, schemes to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere, you know, with high tech solutions. It's completely insane. I mean, it's just on the surface insane, right? Because you cannot continue what we're doing and continuing the damage we're doing and then trying to have a big suction machine somewhere to pull that stuff back out when we have to stop what we're doing, you know, and, and then go carbon negative at the same time. And the only place to do that is via photosynthesis. And photosynthesis starts with agriculture, right? Uh, because the uh, plants uh, the sequester carbon right, out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. There's two to three times more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere. So, so the, but the way we're farming actually releases carbon, right? Because we are, we're killing the microbiome inside the soil by putting chemicals into it, the synthetic nitrogen yeah. fertilizer. Right. I guess my question, Klaus, though, is, is what we're doing in, in farming and agriculture and food, um, it, it's, it's, you know, carbon, it's not, it's not a carbon negative process, it should be, um, it's, it's creating carbon. Is it, how does it compare with the carbon? Is it, is it itself a greater um, emitter of, of carbon than uh, than fossil fuels, say, or you know, buildings or energy. Or do you know so that? I don't. I don't have that number in my head. I don't know if uh, uh, the total volume on a per ton basis of uh, of the food system equals that of the energy system. Um, what I do know, and there are articles, there are science papers out there, is that if we continue to farm the way we do, uh, we will release enough carbon to push us beyond the two degrees. Right. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, I guess just in terms of, I mean, from coming from a, a, a media side, and I'll, I'll get into my introduction, um, my, my background, hi, I'm Michael Grossman, um, and my background is in media. I, I spent my first career in in magazine and newspaper making um, back when that was a thing um, and uh, I then uh, moved into consulting mostly for the same clients but mostly on the case of helping them make the transition into the digital sphere as opposed to you know keeping on going with print um, and in the last few years, I've been working on a project uh, called Factor that is a knowledge sharing, um, knowledge publishing, organizing platform um, that, uh, you know, is, has a lot in common with OGM, which is what 
got me here and and you know I'm involved with a very with a lot of um, similarly focused um, entities who are trying to figure out how to interoperate, how to figure out business models um, that that you know benefit. I mean, the, the basic thing about that we have in common is not being ad supported, not being attention sucking, but rather being, you know, working for uh, our members as opposed to working for advertisers. Um, but to get back around, Klaus, to, to my question is the storytelling around this thing and the easy bullet points, you know, getting people to do something, you know, everybody, Everybody likes to point to um, the change to more people doing, you know, separating their recycling or more people choosing to pay a little more to eat organic as things that um, were stories told rightly or wrongly in the marketplace that changed mass behavior to some degree. And so the storytelling about what individuals can do is really important and prioritizing if if we want them to prioritize um, dealing with the food system as opposed to what they think you know I should buy carbon offsets when I take an airplane if they can or people who can afford to do that or you know I shouldn't use my car so much you know people get that um, a little more easily but if it's not the priority changing the priority or if it's an equal priority fine but I, i'm just trying to get at the storytelling and the numbers and and i think it's a powerful statement to say that um if you deal with this alone that's not enough um but just want to know the proportion i mean i think it would help the storytelling to know the proportion and also in that the food system you're talking about this overall effect of the food system I'm sure people are going to wonder, are we talking about, you know, livestock methane? Are we talking about, you know, what proportion of the different things that are created by the food system so, are at issue? Um, so, Michael, if, if yeah. I understand you correctly, you, you're kind of asking what is the story behind it, uh, backed up with facts, uh, how, how does it and how do you then communicate it to the general audience? Is that kind of what you're trying to figure yeah. out? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, my, my take is, okay, how do, we, how do we motivate a general audience? I think one of the things yeah. that OGM is all about is like, how do we bring together the big thinkers who, you know, have answers and want to set priorities? But my thing is more like, okay, this is interesting. How do we bring it to general knowledge? How do I talk to my like editor friends and, you know, folks like that who, who will tell this story better with some bullet points? Um, yeah, I think we're, we're way, way beyond tinkering on the edges, right? Greta Thunberg summed it up is the house is on fire. I want you to panic, right? We are really at the, at the moment in time where we need the panic and, and to tell people that maybe you should eat less meat or, or separate your trash is just not, not going to get us anywhere. Okay. I mean, truly, we have to truly find a way to convey to people the seriousness of the situ situation we're in and at the same time provide them with, with uh, ways to do something about it, which yeah. is this at the community level, right? Because when you're talking about separating trash, that's abstract. But when, when we're talking about yeah. our water here, our little river running through our cities at risk because, right? And here's what we need to do. I think we're really at this current level of granularity where we have to engage at community level. So um, um, I, we could continue on this discussion. <laughs> I wonder what to do. Either we continue also on uh, giving introductions first and then going, continuing with the discussion, but then it's me determining. <laughs> well, I, I apologize for, for breaking the... No, the, that's fine. I didn't know where we were in the introduction. <laughs> it's kind of what, we, uh, what Terry also happen. did too, yeah. Right. Maybe let so, David go next. He's in the food yeah. business. Okay, cool. David. Me? Oh, cause I'm not in the food business. 
<laughs> You're in the food. Um, I'm Dave Witzel. I'm actually sitting in, in rural Vermont right now, but I'm usually in Oakland, California. Um, and I find this conversation really interesting. I've been, you know, it's kind of been where my head's been spinning over the last uh, decade or so, I suppose. Um, and I can give you my quick take on it, which is I'm spending most of my time coordinating a group called the Global Regeneration Collab that has some familiarity with this, with the OGM. Um, you know, it's, we, I think we did 250 Zoom calls last year um, and, you know, active Slack discussion. And the thought, the conceit is that it's, it's change makers helping change makers create a regenerative future. Um, and I went to the regenerative future concept in part to get away from the scaremongering of climate change. Um, and it may well be that climate change is going to ruin us all, um, but I don't see it as activating people to act. You know, we've been trying to do it for a couple of decades. In fact, I think it's gotten worse, not better, right? And so in some sense, we've created this catastrophe. The idea of panic doesn't seem like a constructive response. So what do you do? My theory is, well, you shift away from focusing on the panic, shift to something positive and optimistic right? Something that, that we want to have happen. I'm going to call that regeneration or regenerative future. And you try to help people create that good thing, right? That good thing gets rid of the bad things, right? As a byproduct. But climate change is, you know, it's a byproduct of a broken economic system, right? So is biodiversity loss. So it is malnutrition. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that are, that are symptomatic of a broken system. What we need is a better system, and so how do we how do we motivate that better system? Okay. And you know, so Michael, we've been you know, like the storytelling piece of it seems really critical, and and we've been looking at um, like solar punk as kind of a model for what this better world looks like, you know, which tends to be you know like lots of solar panels and people floating around in blimps, and you know everybody has a strawberry garden, and you know, but but it is this visioning of a world that we could have if we only worked towards it. Um, and so anyway, so the Global Regeneration Collab is supposed to help people who are helping to create this new world is kind of the, the change concept. Um, okay, and that's that's the main thing you're doing, David. That's what, what your life is yeah. about in the back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah. And I-, um, I, I and Just one I, more comment on that. And I'd be, I'd be curious if anybody has a reaction. Part of that is I've been trying to figure out how to conceptualize it. And one of the things I've been was reacting to somebody talking about wicked problems the other day. And I, my theory is actually focusing on problems as part of the problem, because when you do that, you end up with zero sum outcomes, you end up with fear, you end up with blame, you end up with a lot of non-constructive things, you activate the wrong part of the brain in some sense. So what we want to focus on instead is as opportunities or possibilities or potentiality, something, something optimistic as opposed to pessimistic. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that resonates with anybody, but I'd be curious. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, um, and I saw Doc wa wanted to say something, but then I prefer to first go to the introductions and then continue the discussion after we had the introductions, but that's my preference. So um, if Simon would like to go next, then, and then I go to Doc after we finish the introductions. Yeah. Hi, yeah. I think I'm in, the right, I'm in the right place. You seem to have guys providing all the support I've got the need. <laughs> <laughs> um, I stumbled across this group through Vincent Arena that I suspect most of you know and the Trove platform. Um, I'm working on something in partnership with Vincent which is called the Chrysalis Community. Chrysalis being a metaphor for transformation, the caterpillar instinctively knows when to stop eating everything and consuming it, everything and then it moves into the space which is the chrysalis and transforms into something else humanity 2.0 if you like um, so the platform is um, inspired by a quote by somebody you, you may all know anna lepay an american food advocate um, which is every time you spend money you're casting a vote for the kind of world you want so the highlight whole idea in combination with vincent is to create a portfolio of local projects and good causes whereby local businesses agree to make a donation to the product of the shoppers choosing every time they make a purchase. So it engage and it, it will only, that, that particular directory will only be local small independent businesses. 
So it's all about driving things back down to the local level. And ultimately it's about hollowing out capitalism, but by stealth, because it's been identified people are just so locked into it, they don't know how to break free. Um, when you're focusing on how to put any food on the table, whether it's sustainable or not, is kind of not important in the moment. So it has to be over across a period of time that you, you make the change rapidly, Klaus, absolutely, but uh, still, you need to do something, otherwise you'll end up doing nothing. So that's the idea. John, would you like to go next? Okay, uh, wow. Uh, I have worked for maybe 20 different entities in my career, uh, you could, there are different names you could say of what I was doing. A lot of it would fit under the umbrella of teacher um, from the perspective of um, open global mind, we might say, well, really you were, the kind of teacher you were trying to be was a sense maker. And that's true. I was trying to be a sense maker. I was trying to write that a shared perception of reality. And this does sound like a group I would would be wanting to join if I wasn't already in it. <laughs> But among the things that people are saying here, there's a kind of a continuum um, and there's a fertile ground, I think somewhere between uh, tolerance and consensus that we're look, looking for. We need better, we need to be more than tolerate, tolerating each other and we don't need to completely agree with each other. In fact, we need to appreciate that we're not going to agree with each other and that that shouldn't be the barrier to going ahead. I accept the urgency uh, Klaus and Doug and several other people, you know, they're like, wow, it really is, the house really is on fire. I don't want to make anyone comfortable, quote unquote, comfortable, just recycling or eating less meat, but I do want to have a, a soft ramp. I want to have a way to get people engaged and, you know, urge them along. And I'm recognizing that some of them are going to be engaged in something that may, in scientific terms, be mostly ritual and not effective. And the real question is, does it move them along the continuum? Does it make them part of a community that is accelerating towards the more comprehensive uh, kinds of solutions that we might be talking about? And um, I agree, agriculture is way up there, both whether, whether it equals fossil food or not, fossil fuels or not. It's the point is that it's something many, many more people in the world can, should, and do do. They, you know, we're much, we're much closer to our, our food, or we ought to be much closer to our food, and we could be. It's, it's harder for us to get closer to something that makes a vehicle go, that we ride on. We should, be, we should be there too, but we're not, you know, we're not wind capturing and solar capturing, but we can be food growing, and, and we should. That's my And, and John, is your, your audience, is, was, is it over your life, have it been very broad, the kind of people you were talking to? Uh, if you say 20 different instances. I started out teaching, uh, I started on the teacher corps in Detroit and it was mainly like survive, like make it through the day and keep people from killing each other right in front of you. And it moved on to teaching in a more relaxed high school setting and then teaching teachers and then college teaching, very, very weak first generation college students. and. It moved into consulting. And again, it's the, the complexity of what I was trying to teach increased and the appreciation for the fact that um, there was this very complicated dance with tolerance, difference, uh, enthusiasm, engagement, that that was, that current was dominant, was equal to or dominating the subject matter. You know, and then I, if I didn't want, to, if I didn't figure out how to address that, it wouldn't matter about the relevance or accuracy of what I was trying to teach. Does that make sense? Yes, and it means a lot of different things. I imagine <laughs> in your life so far. It, it, I think plenty of room to expand on that. But um, um, thank you, John. Maybe okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to expand later, but. I, I, yeah. you know, let's, let's, uh, let's go through the process. Yeah. And Scott, would you like to introduce yourself or? Sure. Um, I'm the, the low man on the totem pole 
in the sense of great visions for the future, my intent to be with um, the simple side of things. How can I help people who are not exposed to some of these ideas find ways in that are simple and especially children. Um, but I do know most of my adult friends are not having conversations about anything like this. Their conversations about food are, what are we gonna have for dinner? And we're out of milk. Um, you know, that's, that's it. Um, so my, I'm recently certified in systems thinking from the Cabrera Research Lab. Um, most of the people in that cohort were, I would consider higher level in their, in their careers. They were looking at solving wicked problems, big problems, both inside their corporations and or inside their organizations or inter-organizationally. And I'm trying to help regular people understand the fundamental rules of thinking. Just here they are, here's, here's, here's some simple tools and getting people to even take that first step is something that most people don't cross that threshold. They think, but they don't, they don't ever go meta on their thinking and it doesn't take a lot but that's the area where I tend to like to play instead of, I don't know, I feel like I'm more at the, the parts level than the whole level, if that makes any sense. My background is in graphic design, copywriting, um, and I am known for taking complicated things and simplifying them in a way that has people around the room saying, yeah, that was what I was trying to say. So that's what I am. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Kevin, would you mind introducing yourself there? We don't have Jerry today on the call yet. I don't know where okay. he is. <laughs> I'm Kevin Jones. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been, uh, <clears throat> a lot of the, <clears throat> in this group knows I've been working on this fund to uh, provide friends and family funding to uh, black and brown entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle. And uh, anyway, the checks are going out next week. Uh, we've, we've actually done it. And uh, we're also looking to replicate in a couple of places. Uh, and we're discovering what works and doesn't. So uh, that's, that's what I am. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. And then maybe I can introduce myself. Um, I, um, I've been thinking about like this meta project starting from, okay, there's so many solutions out there already. How could we connect them and build a platform that just shows all the solutions to uh, really thinking really broadly about, okay, what are all the possible collaboration tools and how could we build an on kind of online platform where people can work together on uh, building on knowledge, not just sharing it, but also building on it and how to um, yeah, what's like an effective way to make people work together? Um, I one of the first iterations was kind of building an online event platform for workshops, event conferences, projects, where it's just about events, so a date and a description of an event, and then based on the different methodologies that people use, so like, like a social change calendar. And then I um. I wrote this proposal for the Global Challenges Foundation and then I found out, okay, I actually also want to create kind of a, a meta network on social change. Um, and, and I understood like, okay, meta is different than, than what people are used to. So I'm doing something weird. So people will have all these objections, but then I understood, yeah, but this is actually where it matters. We need to go meta. We need to go larger scale. And it's just another way of thinking. I don't need to solve all the problems. I want to create the tools that help other people solve problems. And I think Vincent Arena is kind of closest in building a prototype on what I wanted in terms of online platform. And I'm also really interested in how to build this kind of meta network where it becomes more effective on, yeah, all these kind of different actors with very different ways of thinking, working together. How might that work? Um, 
most effectively? And what kind of networks do we need? What, what kind of topics do we need to focus on? One of the topics I'm really interested in is ethical power. Like if you go to sociocracy or nonviolent communication or um, Transparency International or people dealing with nonviolent ways of dealing with conflict, it's all it's about transforming the way we deal with power. And that's one of one of the key issues that I think about. So um, and then there is, I guess, Matt or not. Yeah. Um, anyhow. Um, Ah, that's Vincent. <laughs> hey, Vincent. Um, hey. hey. Uh, uh, Jerry's not there, and I propose to do a round of introductions. I, I don't know if you know everyone in the call. <laughs> Otherwise, maybe it's nice to have an introduction from you as well. Oh, man, I'm being put on the spot. Sure. Um, <laughs> let me put on my video. <laughs> you feel comfortable about it. <laughs> I think I, I think I know everyone, almost everyone here. Um, nice to see you, Scott. It's been a little while. Um, hey guys, my name is Vincent. Um, I'm from Long Island. Um, been working on a platform called Trove to help catalyze action and connect people around what matters most, um, projects and events and um, different initiatives around social impact. Um, lately have been, um, yeah, working on kind of like syncing up and connecting a few different, uh, a few different tools for um, doing matchmaking and connecting and databases. Um, it's summer here. I'm probably gonna go for a walk during the, the rest of the call. Um, get a little break from, from screens. By the time Thursday comes, that's like, typically how I'm feeling. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know how much longer the intros you guys are doing, but um, nice to be here. It's been a, little, been a little while, took a little kind of break from these calls because I was just swamped. Thank you, Vincent. Um, and I guess after this, um, Doug, I remember that you had like a comment on the discussion we had before. Maybe let's continue there. And yeah, and I'll there. try and keep it short. It seems to me that our focus tends to be either on the individual and local level or on the societal level. My view is the real power in society is in the intermediate organizations, in particular corporations. Uh, they're highly defended and impervious to social input. And so long as that, that continues, we're not gonna get anywhere on the climate issues. So, so the question is, <clears throat> what's the what's the work around? Um, because clearly, uh, particularly whether that's the food business or the energy business, I think the food business is as heavily defended by corporate interests as is the energy sector. It's just not as obvious, right? But when you look at the concentration in the food business, where you have uh, maybe uh, maybe ten companies basically dominate eighty percent of, of uh, the entire food supply. I mean, from a, in a vertically integrated supply chain, you know, from Monsanto and Tyson and Cargill, Nestle and so on, all the way into the retail sector. That is, that is a machine that is extremely difficult to change. And in particular, because of their perceived efficiency, right? This vertical integration has created a perceived e efficiency they are unable to really change. So if you are telling McDonald's to source local fresh food, it's impossible that there isn't a knife in the kitchen to slice a tomato with, right? It's a basically, it's an assembly line kitchen that works with prefabricated products coming in. So to change that, you have to work around it and it has to start local. No, so, so I, I mean, the, the local empowerment is, to my, in my mind, the only way that you can break this this corporate stranglehold. Um, hmm. um, I could say so many things, but I, like, whenever I'm on these calls, I notice, yeah, that this is the level to tackle the issue but then I noticed yeah but isn't it all the levels <laughs> in a way also like 
there's a leadership of these corporations. They are kind of probably in organizations uh, like the Lions Club and Rotary where they connect. And there's all these kind of leadership organizations where people could be reached, which are in organizations. Then there's uh, trade organizations where they're in. There's, there's all kinds of platforms where you could reach these corporations. And you can also reach them by the end of the cycle where it's the consumers and the people selling the stuff. So I wonder, there's, I, I guess there's people working on all levels, right? NGOs working on all these different levels. Um, so I'm, I'm still curious, like, uh, I don't know what the question is behind it. Well, how do you deal with it as OGM maybe? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> What is our, what is our job or something? I don't know, but um, Kevin wants um, to say something. Yeah. yeah, ah, yeah, Kevin. Yeah, I wanted to just. I I think that's an interesting critique, and I think it's right. Uh, <clears throat> I see this group coming up with a different silver bullet every time. Oh, it's corporations. Oh, it's the individual, or it's local. I'm, I'm a real fan of Eleanor Ostrom's thing that the solution to a global problem is not a global solution. It's polycentric. It's everywhere there's a center, everywhere you have pressure. And, you know, I think um, silver bullets of any kind are, um, you know, it, it, they worked for the Lone Ranger in the, in the, you know, in the 1950s. But, you know, the, you, you, you don't solve wicked problems with, with silver bullets. So that's just a... But I think this is a group that seems to like silver bullets, and it could be because of its technical, you know, uh, software heritage or something or other. But I, I, I think I, I really see that what, what you're saying that uh, uh, this group likes silver bullets. I think is really true. Yeah. Another way to put it, you could say also it's it's about having the silver bullets on all the levels or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, <whatever. laughs> I mean, that's that's more, more, more inclusive to say like it's not. There's. I don't see something against silver bullets. Um, I just kind of want to mention that's, that's, like, that's kind of a, going, a human, huh? silver bullets is more of a human limitation than this group. But we can only process five things at a time, so we can do also, yeah. limit it to one. Yeah, but I then, think silver bullets are American. Mm. I, I think they're universal. Bullets, I, I see sure. that issue all around the whole world. I mean, the phrase is American, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, the, the superhero movies are also kind of American, maybe. I'm not sure. But, <laughs> they have this. but then it's more, yeah. Anyhow, I don't think that goes to any essence. But um, I remember also Steve Waddell's uh, book on Global Action Networks, where he says it's actually about bringing together all the actors and making them work together on the solutions. And doing this will create change. Uh, for instance, uh, if you've got slave diamonds in the South Africa, um, you've got the ones who sell it in, um, in Antwerp, for instance, there's a big uh, sales of diamonds, then you bring the two actors together to talk about what could be a solution and working on this multi-actor level might be the most effective as well. And I guess, Klaus, you're doing that as well or not? The core reason why corporations are so much successful is that they're working in a hierarchy. So you have very few people make a decision which is then being executed throughout this hierarchy. The problem with these very few people making decisions is that they are basically uh, devoid of any moral compass and, and have uh, ambitions that are counter to, to the interests of the rest of society. But that China is amazingly successful because of its hierarchy. The problem is hierarchy then is on the one hand, yes, it's super efficient, but on the other hand, uh, it is not guided by the commons. Right? But so as we are competing against these very successful hierarchies, we also have to establish some hierarchy, right? We can't all be running in the circle uh, without having a clear understanding of the construct that we are trying to support and what our role could be within this construct, right? So what we are, I just put a project outline into the chat here 
I mean, we're trying to develop a construct right, that, that helps us to self-organize in a way where uh, uh, anyone can find a place saying, yeah, I could really function here and make an impact. Uh, so so the, and, and in a completely decentralized, in a completely self-organizing fashion, but there, there has to be a vision first, you know, that, that we all embrace. And once we embrace that vision, then we can find a place within it where that, 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 apply, that, that caters or that, that speaks to our unique skills, our superpowers, you know, our ability to contribute. So that's sort of my, uh, that's sort of where, we're, where I'm pushing with this, with this project plan here. Um, yeah, Simon? Yeah, I was thinking about what you said there, Klaus, about you know, hierarchies and corporations and the people at the top, a handful of people making the decisions. I think the problem is compounded by the fact that the whole corporation is structured on ambition, where we're all taught that we want to be at the top of the hierarchy making those decisions. I mean, I'm particularly inspired by just a simple quote, give what you can, receive what you need. I think the future has to be far more egalitarian and people re need to redefine what it is to be ambitious. And if it's simply within career terms, then nothing's going to change because it feeds into those big corporations. Um, you know, they control the educational system. They control the, the message in terms of what ambition is. Um, and when you're, you know, when the world's on fire, as you describe it, then aspiring to a big house and a fast car doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? But people are still the message. Right. Thanks. Um, Michael? Yeah, um, I'm just uh, struck by, in, in what you said, Eric, earlier, and actually Simon and Klaus, you too, um, that, you know, dealing with things at multiple levels um, ha has to be um, inspired by, by, changing hearts and mind at the most distributed level. So, I mean, I think it's very right that, you know, we have to find the things that decentralized groups and, and individuals can do, but realize that doing things that affect the conversation that filters up the hierarchy to, to legislators, to corporate leaders, to the point where they're realizing, hmm, we are operating in a capitalist system or we are operating in response to voters. And there is, there is a sentiment going around that um, X thing is a problem and we at least better look better. Um, I mean, you see energy companies and in some cases, you know, Auto, I mean, you see, you see like, oh, well, you know, people kind of want electric cars. Oh, well, people kind of want us to, you know, I mean, BP, you know, totally cynically going from British petroleum to beyond petroleum and having a logo that, you know, is a green flower, even as they are responsible for the most terrible, you know, M most negatively effective oil spill in, in you know, American history. It's, it's terrible, but you also see that, that it's built on people's response to sentiments that are building in a decentralized, I hesitate to use the word populist, but popular um, way. And it's not a silver bullet. And you know, we <laughs> I don't I don't like the idea of, of using bullets as a metaphor because because that would go to me saying like we need to give everybody the ammunition, you know, they all need to have bullets. Um, but but it is true that the 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 talking points and the sentiment and the things that end up filtering up as I'm gonna do something popular. I mean uh, you know, Biden is saying things right now that would have been perceived as absolutely, you know, communistic and radical if they'd come out of the mouth of, you know, Bill Clinton um, 20 years ago. Um, but 
it, the, the conversation has changed enough around, around climate change, around inequality, around all these things, and that all happened bottom up. Um, so, you know, attaching, attaching terms to these things, whether it's, you know, fair trade, organic, sustainable, regenerative, you know, stories of what people can do and what organizations they can connect with, as, as, as Klaus is saying, um, seems key to getting what's happening at the top and what's happening from the corporate interests to like bend, at least bend, and legislation to happen. Vincent, you, you also wanted to say something? Yeah, so thanks, Eric. Um, <clears throat> so a few points. So uh, on the point of like making corporations bend, like I'm curious what you guys think about um, Elon Musk and like the different companies um, that Elon Musk has, you know, helped kind of bring into flourishing. And I feel like my personal opinion is that um, they've actually like nailed the story telling and they've sold a vision for the future that makes people really excited about going to space or driving an electric car or having tunnels underground, right? Like stuff that would be kind of boring or, or that, that people aren't really as like interested in people are excited about it now again because of the way that Elon Musk has built this kind of like brand and like fetishize the future even if the future that we're actually heading towards is not going to be that great it's like it's it's all about the perceived future and um and it, and while it seems like someone like Elon Musk especially with like the electrification has had a lot of like you know kind of positive impacts on the world I also I'm kind of hesitant to like when you look at the bigger picture of the different solutions, for example, the Hyperloop is very much still relying on car infrastructure, even if it's electric cars, it's not like, why don't we just create better subway systems, right? Like it's, it's, it's actually just kind of preserving the current car based economy and status quo. Um, and although Tesla has like put a huge push on the electric industry to like adopt electric i think that's probably the biggest positive like systemic impact that elon musk has had but i don't know besides that i almost feel like uh those efforts kind of go in vain without really changing the bigger picture system of things um i'm curious what other people think about that yeah to me there's no better way to describe how alienated the scope is from the, the real world than impossible foods and beyond meats. I mean, that's an outcome of Bill Gates starting a research lab in around uh, 2012 or 2010 or so in Seattle to uh, experiment with plant-based protein extracts and make them taste like meat. And that has advanced, and, and he did this in partnership with Monsanto, uh, and he's a major investor in both of these companies. Uh, and all of this was run through the World Economic Forum, where uh, all these uh, very powerful, very wealthy people you know, controlling wealth beyond most governments. You now Gates is rumored to have invested $6 billion in this entire venture. And what it does, it is continues the destruction of the natural world, right? Because it's soy based. So when that when that uh, came about, he uh, you you can see you can see in uh, in South America, uh, uh, Brazil, you know, erasing more of the Amazon uh, to clear room for more soy, which is then being processed into. Uh, a, a protein extract, which is then being processed further with the GMO, or maybe with, with artificial yeast cultures that are then, you know, transferring that into something that tastes like meat. Uh, it, it is it is completely alien. They, they are so alienated and so separated from the natural world, you know, that they find technical solutions that ignore, first of all, socioeconomic needs of the population. I mean, what are these people? What are these people all supposed to do? 
who are now eating artificial meat. Now, I mean, there are, you know, it's like 60, 70 percent of the world population is in some way or form connected with producing food, you know, growing food, processing food, and so on. So, so, so the 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 callousness, right, and the the um, philosophical separation of an Elon Musk and you know, all the, the Bill Gates and all these names um, from 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 nature itself is what what is causing incredible problems. And then we have no regulatory oversight, right? Because the World Economic Forum is people, there's no, there's no government in there. So they're basically, you have multinational corporations making decisions over our food supply where, where there is no European Union or even the United States or anybody powerful enough to, in, to insert regulatory oversight into this process. There's no, no public debate. Is this the right thing to do? What is the impact of it? So, and you can see right now in the political arena, you know, how people are fighting over this, you know, to reject the, uh, the, the, the influence or the, the impact of government. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, thank you, Klaus. Um, I find it a really interesting topic. And I wonder also if you would just do the remaining 30 minutes, like uh, a check in as usually uh, Jerry is doing it. Um, and for me, those questions we are talking about are really essential. I really love to understand like what is the level that makes most sense to, to interact or to react or to activate or I don't know how to call it. Like what, what are the essential levels that we can have leverage points or something? Um, anyhow, shall we continue with check-in or is there any other preference in the room? I just have a quick comment. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much it would cost to create um, um, an, uh, an OGM movie if we took like all the OGM calls or all like similar calls, like talking about what we've been talking about, clip together the best snippets and add other content to kind of like create a very compelling story of like, you know, kind of condensing these conversations into like a kind of movie or documentary format. I'm curious, A, if that would be something that might actually be able to change people's perspective of these problems, B, would be feasible, and C, would be something that we actually might be able to pull off. It seems like there's just so much thought and like past synthesizing of this, like these very complex problems that goes into these calls. And I'm always like, there needs to be like 200 people here listening, not, not, you know, not 20 or 30. So I'm just curious what you guys think about that. Does anybody like to react on this? Yeah. I, I thought, I've thought, yeah. oh, sorry. I was yeah, just gonna say, it's an awesome idea. I'd, I'd love to promote that, Vincent, if you could put it together by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've often thought that and, and we've talked about this a little bit before that um, the idea of a presentation, you know, maybe it's not the form that the Thursday meeting takes, but the idea of inviting people to present some concept, you know, if like if, if this call had been, you know, billed in advance as um, centering around questions of, of um, our food systems and their effect and, you know, Klaus and a couple of other panelists that, you know, he chose had, had done a presentation at the beginning and then there was a Q&A and we disseminated the fact that this was happening far and wide. And then the next week it was on another subject and it was, you know, Kevin talking about the project that he's doing, you know, all, all different projects and also projects from people who are not historically OGMers, there would be more effect. I mean, we're, we're talking a lot among ourselves now and, and to what Vincent was saying, and then that would be something with a subject that would be searchable by other people who would be looking around for information on a particular subject. It's hard, even, even if, 
even if you knew OGM and even if you knew the subjects we were talking about, you would never find the conversations we're having. And you're right, Vincent, it would have to be like, you know, super cut in different ways for it to be useful and for other people to hear it. Um, but I think there's something that we can do about what the, what the form OGM conversations take is so that even without production, they, they leave something more valuable um, and possibly attract more people. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Michael. It, uh, one short comment there is that I, I believe there is something about just this open space that um, the Cherry has been offering. It seems to have done a lot over a year, like the first year, just people being able to express themselves and find each other seems to have added value to many people. And now it, I'm, I wonder if there is a search for what is what what's next. Also, Jerry has been experimenting with maybe different formats. What I hear you say is kind of let's have an overarching topic or someone presenting something. So that's that's a nice idea, I guess. I, and I don't mean to say, Eric, just to, to clarify, yeah. I'm not saying instead i'm saying and you know yeah, yeah. Like, you know this is the the metaphor that's been used before is like this is church you know we're getting together we're all we're all singing from the same hymnal and you know it's it's very nice to to share our thoughts with each other and we get inspired and sometimes a couple of us you know go do something but mm. this is a church with a closed membership that never has the little thing out front that says, you know, sermon this, I'm not a big fan of religion, so I'm sorry I'm using this metaphor, but you know, <laughs> you know, sermon on Sunday on this, you know, come on, come one, come all. And if you're interested in that, um, so, I mean, I just think that kind of outreach piece and, and permeability um, is important too. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I would just I would just say I actually had this conversation with Jerry yesterday um, about both the format of this call and how we kind of could have either changed this call or have additional calls. Um, and I apologize, my my camera's off. I had a small procedure the other day on my face, so I'm just leaving the camera off for today. But one thought was that we could have different facilitators potentially like have different people who are part of the community facilitate the conversation. The other part was what Michael's talking towards which is to talk about specific projects to, to learn more about what people are working on, um, to have conversation around those projects um, and leave that open space that way. I, I, I'm in favor of kind of diving deeper into what people are working on and maybe that's a way we activate our community in terms of, hey, like that sounds like a really interesting pro project. Then you have a recording you can put into Mattermost. You can have a call out to say like, if anyone's interested in volunteering time or energy or resources, um please reach out uh, i think and as well as kind of externally if you want to but i think that's a, a a pretty sensible path forward i would just i would say okay thanks so john yeah yes um in some ways what we're talking about uh exists in parallel on clubhouse <clears throat> and to mean at least nine out of ten clubhouse rooms are, would be a waste of time, uh, you know, and I t might tap in and say, well, yeah, clearly these people are either drifting the way we are on a very bad day, or they're going down a, a weird rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. Uh, but that one in 10, and, and some of them do overlap. There's the, there's a solar punk one. There's a post abundance kind of conversation. And in those conversations, there's a lot more energy comes into the room. A lot more people come in and go in the audience. Now, there's interesting things about them. They're hierarchic. There's, there are people on stage, and then there's people listening. And you can ask to come up on stage, but sometimes you can't get on stage. I mean, it's, sometimes it's crowded, or sometimes the people who are on stage, that's the reason why people are there. They're there. They see that name, and they know that linking, and a whole bunch of people come into the room because so-and-so there's this guy chris uh, fornoff there's a there's uh, of course eric uh, weinstein you know there's a couple of people who have followings 
because whether you agree with them or not, they've been able to articulate uh, rich position, informationally rich positions. And so they get up there and they say, this is how it is, or isn't it this way? And a lot of people say, wow, at least I'm going to pay attention to that. Now, there's, a, there's another model, and I'm, I'm not going to, you know, the model is, there are a lot of things we, won't, we don't like about this model, uh, like the, uh, the debate model, or the, you know, the, 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 there are several debate models, including debate models where every, it's real obvious to everybody that, yes, it's a debate, and yes, they're going to vote at the end, and they're going to vote on which side changed, but really, it's a it's a platform for people who have evolved positions on a thing to, to articulate their position. And the debate structure is just a, a, a trick, a trick to frame the positions. And th there might be something there. I, I, I don't know that it's debate structure. There, there's a thing that people do in the Bay Area called BATS. It's, they said, you know, people aren't coming to improv even though it's really interesting stuff, but let's have a competition between two improv groups. We'll make it theater sports, and then you know it'll, it'll be more interesting. So I mean, something something that um, you know, we we have a group, or or we we have funny dollars, or we have green dollars, or whatever we are, you know, and, and we're going to hear pitches for what is the best thing you could do in the next six months. And there are various people are going to pitch, and then you're, we're going to vote the the green dollars. Not are the green dollars real? No, but they're not not real either. They're they'll be recorded. We'll see we'll see that outcome. Um, we might take further action, as in the things that get green dollars. The suggestion there is drill drill more in that direction. The things that don't get any green dollars, maybe maybe delay drilling on that direction. Let's go into that one about, okay, what do we do about agriculture now in the next six months and along a continuum of, of who we are and, and what we have potentially to contribute. So that's just a, a framework. I know it's not, it's not really an answer, but I think if something other than just a, 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 a documentary would be necessary to, uh, to broaden the engagement and um, we might have to deal with hierarchy we might have to deal with you know okay we need some we need some cheerleaders basically for these things we need people who are pitching in order to generate the energy and, and focus around it that's that's going to be necessary to bring the other people in okay thanks um so how i'm a bit confused like what is the best way forward but i I do feel something for a check-in, but maybe like an extra question, but I'm not clear yet. Something like what's going on for you and what seems essential in regards to OGM right now, something like that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Klaus. Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify, uh, I mean, I say hierarchy. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, click the wrong button here. When I say hierarchy, I mean hierarchy of ideas, not, not organizational or structural hierarchy. No, but there has to be uh, an agreed upon course of action that requires um, a, a model. And then, so within and that model is hierarchical because you need, you need to structure the idea uh, and the, the activation of this idea in a way that allows different components to fit into it, if that makes sense. So it's not about creating hierarchy in a in a in an organizational sense. There's Jerry. <laughs> hey, Jerry. <laughs> Holy crap. So I'm pretty sure I was in this link. It's just that it was just Stacy and me, and we just spent an hour talking. Sorry, everybody. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, where'd everybody go? <laughs> Damn, Phil! Thanks for telling me that this uh, that this was here. I, I checked my email. I checked Mattermost in the calls channel. I'm like, if somebody if somebody's missing or not missing us, surely they'll pipe up there. So I I totally missed anybody trying to figure out uh, where we were or whatever. So sorry to interrupt. 
You could introduce yourself. That's what we can do. I'm I'm the newest monster in the monster factory, and I'm 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 in training to figure out how to go scare kids, because because the world is powered by children's screams. Mm. I see. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Jerry, I would have reached out earlier. I joined at quarter to the hour as well. So I, I assumed you excused yourself some way. Um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's like I, I, we, I was just sitting there. Stacy and I had a very nice conversation for an hour going, golly, where is everybody? That's interesting. I, yeah, sorry. We probably should have poked you a bit. Uh, you know what? It looks like it turned out the way it needed to turn out. So I'm happy you all are here. And this call is being recorded somehow. So was ours. And I'm pretty sure... It was the same link. So I was in a, I was in like an, an 80 person Zoom not run by me a couple of weeks ago where the Zoom just broke mid call and everybody was trying to come back into the same place. And we ended up in two different pods and the whole meeting just kind of dissolved because there was a process we were trying to go through and it didn't, you know, the process fell apart once we weren't one cohort. Uh, so I think that this might be random Zoom lightning of some sort. Sounds like scaling issues. They're starting to try and distribute the load and yeah, something. Anyway, don't let me know. Where were you? Where were you? Let me. Uh, I think right back. now we were kind of talking about the format of the OGM calls and there oh, was something about having like a main focus or someone pitching something in the beginning, but also having both ends. Like one element is really focusing on a certain topic, then but then still having this open space. There was something about uh, having cheerleaders <laughs> and facilitators. Um, is there anything essential that anybody wants to add? Because I'm not a good synthesizer for the moment, maybe, but- um, That was pretty good as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah that was so, great, Eric. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm really, I'm really interested in alternate formats, experiments, uh, whatever we might do. And I don't know how many people who joined for the, and it's very funny because it, it just being Stacy and me, I was like, well, that seems like definitive evidence that something's fucked up about these calls. <laughs> um, so I'm totally happy to experiment uh, with these calls and see where it is. And I don't know how many people just like us to go around the room and check in and feel like that's, I, mean, I know that Scott Mooring several times long ago uh, was saying like, this is like, this feels like my community check-in. I, I, I'm you know, waiting for that. So Scott, I, uh, that was like, like a signal for me that what we were doing was okay and the rhythm that it was in, but, but experiments would be cool. Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, Scott, go ahead. Um, my, my first observation, I think, was similar to what you said, Jerry, about you were in the room with one other person and wondering, oh, all right, maybe this is how things are going. And what's interesting to me is that I was in this room and I felt the same thing. Mm. And I, I actually took a little screenshot because I do from time to time because I like to remember who I'm, who I'm with. And I thought, has OGM jumped the shark? Has the Thursday, the Thursday call 1.0, has that, has that chapter closed? And now it's something new. And because before it was, it really was people hanging out because they didn't have anyone to hang out with. I mean, it was like you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't talk to anyone. And, you show up and there's all these people and they're from around the world and they're doing all these interesting things and everyone's excited to see everybody. And then there was that transition period, kind of phase two, if you will, where, okay, well, wait a minute, what are we doing? What are we doing? Because what, what are we doing here? We started to lose a few people and then people started to coalesce into actual projects and things are happening and and uh, you know, people started to get some some traction on that. And then, as that happened, things it it changed. But we kind of have left it as, oh, it's the same thing. It's still the Thursday call. Everybody's getting together and just saying hi, how you doing? And if I remember right, in the Mattermost, it was like the last week was labeled the somber call or something like that, or maybe it was two weeks ago or something. And I thought all due respect, and I mean this sincerely, the problems you all are trying to deal with are, are somber. 
they're huge. They're wicked. They don't have solutions. They just have dances that we have to figure out. You know, you can't solve these things. They just exist and you can make them better or you can make them worse. But, but you know, you have to just be with these problems and try to try to help. But that changes the nature of the call and the work that we do. And I, I think that's, that's, you know, it's, it's needed. Absolutely. But it also, when I come in on the Thursday, I'm like, oh, okay. Everyone's going to talk about all of the stuff we have to do. And I think, yeah, okay, that's, that's true. And yet that's also, I miss, I miss the coffee time too. Okay, so. Anything else? Um, you're reminding me vividly kind of that when I lived in Berkeley on Thursday mornings, uh, we met, John, I don't know if you've gone to these. Uh, yeah, but, but like Thursday mornings at uh, Saul's Deli, <clears throat> basically down uh, like a block down from uh, what's the famous Chez Panisse <clears throat> in, in, in the Gourmet Ghetto, Gourmet Gulch, what's it called? Um, and, and it was really fun because like the, the geeks in Berkeley would just hang out and over bagels and coffee and scrambled eggs or whatever. It was really fun. And that, that's a piece of what's intended here. It's interesting that you say that because I have a comment that I'm going to put forth in another group that is called a cohort. And my comment is going to be, you can call something a cohort, but that doesn't make it a cohort because there's just no activity, there's no life. And I know that there's all these other OGM worlds. You know, I see all the emails and things which I'm not really participating in, but um, I think that's the, that's the nature of that is that we're all working on these things and you kind of, oh, what are you working on? Oh, what are you working on? And you, and you just, it's not that you're, you're in bed together as much as you are just sort of, oh, you're kind of inspired by that. And then they look at your thing and they say, oh, you know, maybe that would be interesting over here or have you met um and i think doug had made a really interesting comment earlier about most of us seem to be working either at the global level or at the individual local level and that the the, the real power in his estimation was in the, the middle and then eric brought up this idea of well at what level are we best able to work and I don't know as we got anywhere as we tend to as we go meta then we get meta about our meta as we, we tend to do but I think that was just an interesting idea because I see Klaus getting some real traction with his food systems and Vincent with his his uh, you know his collective systems that he's trying to build and I think Eric in the same way and and you know then there's other people who are working working at the local level with really small groups of people and 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 how do you how do you make an impact as opposed to just as I think John Kelly was talking about on uh, the the thing where everybody listens into the conversations like clubhouse I clubhouse um, where there's a lot of people sitting around navel gazing and they're just not they're not getting anywhere but there's a few that are that are actually getting some traction and and um, I don't know. So now I'm I'm starting to get off track, but but that was kind of a summary of what we talked about and and it's that difficult balance between working together and being together, I think. Yeah, can, I would like to add something to what you just said, Scott. Like for me the quality of you, Jerry, is a kind of hard space on the big amount of complexity that we're dealing with. There's like a, a space where we can really express ourselves and where something seems to sink. Like for me, it's been very activating mentally because there's so many ideas on the call, but at the same time, there's a, an atmosphere which is open, inclusive in a way, um, accepting everyone's viewpoints and really trying to figure out together and, and seeing all the different viewpoints at the same time. At the same time, there is also this kind of dread and uh, the world, the house is on fire, we were talking about before. I think we have to deal with world pain. We have to deal also with uh, 
this is affecting us on a personal level as well. And this struggle of trying to get things done is very painful on a, on a certain level as well. Like it's, there's a lot of frustration, a lot of trying, a lot of burnout, a lot of levels of how, how do we deal with this and what's the most meaningful thing then to do together? Because I want it to make sense for me. I want it to help me move forward. And that's kind of in itself, maybe also a wicked problem even. <laughs> How do we do OGM calls? It's not a simple question, I would say. And we might find a simple answer and then we have a balance and equilibrium model by itself. But I want to just also say those different points to yeah, bring it in our awareness. Yeah. I just I just want to express how grateful I am for what you just said. Mm. That was really lovely and helpful. Uh, and, and, and sometimes we have somber calls because there's all these global crises. <clears throat> a lot of us are trying to figure out how to make a living doing this thing and trying to be helpful. And that's, the, we have like our own little personal crises, you know, going along the side. Uh, and, and in the middle, we're trying to pick our way through the giant hairball uh, of issues that, that, that we're, we would like to improve or have, make a dent in. Anybody else um, on this team? Um, Jerry, just to to share with you, um, I put something in the chat, but um, Vincent had raised the idea of. Um, I hope I'm going to be saying this okay, but Vincent, you can pipe up if I'm if I'm not describing it correctly. But the idea of creating sort of th thinking about how self-reflexive um, what we're doing what we have been doing ongoingly is and that, that it's useful in that but how all the important things that are said in little snippets over the course of multiple conversations um you know that to be able to bring those together in an edited way even on certain subjects and have those available to people outside our small community would be a useful thing because you wouldn't know to delve into one of our long calls um, to get into the group. Um, and I think that's a great idea. And then I was also bringing up um, uh, in the chat, the idea that um, doing, somebody had mentioned Clubhouse just in general and uh, I guess it was John who was talking about it's admittedly hierarchical structure where you have like imagine that this conversation was happening among us it had been convened on on clubhouse other people who had intersected with us in other ways on other platforms but were on club clubhouse I'm sorry had intersected with us in other uh clubhouse meetings um would see you know Michael is talking, Eric is talking, Jerry is talking, Klaus is talking, you know, be brought to this group in real time and might be in the hallway, as they call it, and, and listening to our conversation. So that would bring in new people and other people who were attracted by the subject we were discussing would show up and be the audience. And maybe some people would raise their hands and get on stage and become part of this, you know, conversation and then become part of Thursday Zoom check-ins and you know there would be some some outreach from that and that's you know a fairly low lift thing to do um, you know maybe maybe holding a meeting or two on Clubhouse just as an experiment among us might be a, a worthwhile thing to do. So this I, I have to bounce in five minutes and you're all welcome to stay here since you were doing just fine before I bounce in. Um, but what you just said fits exactly and perfectly a conversation I had two Sundays ago uh, with a guy named Pat Scannell, who I didn't know before that at all. He and I are on a geeky telecom mailing list. And I really liked his post. So I wrote him separately and I said, dude, you know, I'd love to just talk and, and, and do mind melts. And we had a great conversation about a bunch of stuff. He is like Eric, like me, like Scott, like a bunch of us trying to solve the world's problems and has got four books that are none of which are actually sort of published but he's working on a on a series of answers to how the, how the world works but as a result of our conversation i was like 
what if OGM were on the surface a vlog or a podcast or a show? And under the surface, we were doing OGM-y things to all of the conversations and all the artifacts of the show. And the subjects of our show were kind of like a pilgrimage to big thinkers who are trying to solve the different pieces of the puzzle. And we might have a couple of them together and the object would be to see where is the overlap in their thinking. And, and like the object would be not to just do a bunch of broadcasts with famous people and whatever, but to try to deconstruct and crystallize what we're all trying to say about how to, how to fix the world or how to, how to improve the world. Um, and, and the name weaving the world was like uh, an idea that came up. It's maybe a little too big, maybe weaving something smaller, but the idea of weaving, I like a lot because I think some of the tools we're talking about these, these, you know, uh, visualization tools are the modern loom. They're, they're idea looms in different ways. And we're trying to weave a context or a fabric for society to be able to hang in and build stuff together as, as kind of a shared asset. Um, so what if we just create a show and the show doesn't have to live in one platform. So what you all just said about Clubhouse, we could meet once a week, twice a week, we could have set hours you know, in Clubhouse that then feed the rest of the things that we're doing and are just we, we could just sort of show up on Clubhouse to say, who else wants to be part of this? Uh, this is what we're doing. Here's how the conversation works. But then under, under the hood, uh, under the ground, we would have like my seal, but too bad Judy's not on the call, but like dendritic connections made between the kinds of things that we're doing. And then we could, we could promote and find and maybe fund and build some of the connections between the tools. We could do the work that we're trying to do at the tools level kind of underneath as we move forward so that the results of all these these different things would would show up uh, more usably, more visibly, uh, more usefully in the commons as we go. And I'm 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 thinking here of the way that uh, Max Harper took the transcript of one of our early OGM calls <clears throat> and mapped it in Miro so that you could see the conversation as a visual dialogue. That's really interesting, and that's just one of a hundred different ways you could sort of do this. Um, several of you are working to just make the Zoom chats more usable because when the transcript shows up, it's just a text file with a lot of timestamps and a lot of garbage in it. So how do we strip that away and make it more usable? But how do we also flow that into the general body of work we're curating together? So if that sounds interesting, like let me know or whatever, but but that was that was already in my head before you just said what you just said. So it, I'm, I'm just curious, could we have like a raise of hands? Who thinks that making uh part of OGM into a show is an interesting idea. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> Michael's skeptical, but maybe. <laughs> and, 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 and the important that if the show eats up all of our energy and we suddenly become show producers, that's probably not a good thing, but how do we, how do we take what we're already doing and, and like make it more visible, usable and be part of the larger kind of conversations is interesting to me. Um, and any thoughts before I have to bounce? Yeah, there's not so many uh, social change podcasts on this kind of level. So it might be a niche that's interesting for people. That's one there's, idea. And there's plenty of podcasts of people trying to talk big thoughts about how to solve the world and politics and yeah. whatnot. There's a lot of those, but I, I'm wondering how we like how we differentiate what we say. Uh, Michael, you were skeptical. Yeah, I want to jump oh, back in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that I do feel like there are a lot of podcasts like this you know, I, I mean, I, I just, I just feel like these kinds of conversations are going on um, everywhere, and the, the 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 pushback I had on the notion of show is what I was saying about about Clubhouse is already more hierarchical than we are, but is beneficial in the fact that it invites people in, and there's a really permeable membrane from being an audience member to being a participant. Whereas a show sounds more like, you know, we know and listen to us. So that that was my skepticism is just- Show, you know, show may be the yeah. wrong framing. It's maybe it's a public conversation yeah. uh, or, or a public, I, I like the word like inquiry. I think inquiry is really nice, like collective inquiry, collaborative inquiry. Uh, that may be a better framing. I don't know. I, yeah. I'm, have just, pushing, I'm just pushing the participatory nature of a nature of it that makes it you know something that people enter into easily. i think we many of us have to go to, to other calls so um so so stew on that um thank you for being here you've like brightened my day a lot um 
and uh, see you in the on the tubes and uh, next week and all that. Thanks. Thanks everyone also for the introductions. It's really helped. Thank Hello. you, Eric. thank you, Eric, for for being our our guide. Our, yeah. <laughs> thrown thrown into the into the job and it's really awesome. yeah for me it was really valuable to see the introductions of people it helped me to connect to the human being and the motivation and what was like the real driving force of people in the call so at least for me it was helpful i hope for others as well <laughs> yeah. if anybody yeah. wants to stay on i'm happy to stay on for a while but uh yeah so uh, I think I'm going to move okay. on. Um, the 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 basic summary of, of what I was saying earlier is that I'm trying to help people who are overwhelmed figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. And for most people, that's not to solve the. It's what can I do here now in my space? So okay, but it all rolls up. Anyway, thank you guys. Okay. Thanks, Scott. John, Michael, Vincent. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, Eric, I thought you were so. Up, oh, Eric left. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I was just going to say he did a good job moderating. I thought I so I came in late and I thought Jerry was intentionally not going to be at the call and that he had passed it to Eric to take over. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> no, it was a, it was an odd moment where you know, like I said, I I felt like it had jumped the shark. Does that reference mean anything to you? Ah, uh, no, actually. Okay, well, well, all right. So, so it's worth it's worth explaining. So, there was a show called Happy Days, which was in the nineteen seventies, I think, um, and it was very popular. It was just classic sitcom. You know, and is it the bar one or what? Is it the bar one? Yeah, the one it was bar? in a bar. There, there was yeah, yeah. yeah, it was like set in the nineteen fifties. So anyway, the show's been on for years. Everybody watches it because you know in the seventies it was just on at a certain time slot, and and that's all you had your choice for. So at one point, one of the main characters, um, goes out to California and, and is in a he has to jump a, a tank of sharks on water skis. This has nothing to do with the regular program at all. <laughs> it's just like they have this weird little side thing. And so what it, what it became is a, a, me a metaphor for when a TV show is like, okay, they jumped the shark. Like they they lost their vision. They went on and and did this like they they're trying to keep their audience. They were trying to do something. They they lost their way, and then it expanded beyond television programs. And jump the shark just meant whatever this used to be. It was great, and now Fast and the Furious Nine. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, yeah. like, like or or it was probably several back. But, it, but that's that's the phrase that's where it came from it was this moment when you realize no they're they're it's done whatever that was was awesome it was, but it's done now it's this joke in space balls where they say like rocky 5000 <laughs> exactly it's the same joke it's, it's the same joke so it, it's worth saying and so when I came on and I saw one the group was small two, the group was somber, three, the group was silent and not animated at all. And, and Klaus had even said, everybody's so quiet. I thought, well, and then Jerry wasn't there. I just thought, wow, this Thursday call has kind of jumped the shark. You know, it, it was something. And I think the reason that everyone was attracted to it has gone away because it, it peaked. It had, you know, we had 25 people on the call every week. And then it just kind of stopped. Well, it depends because there's different dynamics, right? Like it can have sh jumped a shark, but there's also possibility. You know, this is, this is sometimes sitcoms will have a break off sitcom 
<laughs> you know, like they'll take one of the characters and they'll they'll have their own show. I think the Thursday Call has become its own show, and the original series is just it's it's dead. It's not what it used to be at all. Um, mm. Which was you're talking about the check-ins and everyone was excited to get in and 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 Jerry would moderate and, and just like you did to keep everyone getting their little window, but. It, we lost the the optimism. We lost the excited to see you bit, um, yeah. you know. And that's okay. I wonder if productions was the best idea. It helped me, but I wonder if it helped the call. But uh, <laughs> I, I I like it because I can get finally a picture of what people are really doing. Like there, often there's like a story in the week what keeps them busy. But in between the lines, you can kind of read what they're doing. But I like also to really hear what they're doing. So, but then what, one I, thing I, I did what, notice. Eh? One thing I did notice is that no one passed on giving their background. Yeah, that's true. And that's, I think, in a lot of ways, most people, especially with weighty topics like this, are just looking for someone to listen, anyone to listen. So they can say what it is that they're that that's important to them. Yeah, and I'm also wondering to, I, how to identify what's really going on because I I can make assumptions about what's going on, but still, why does it go down the number? It's tricky to figure really figure out really. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder what you wanted to tell me before I, I jumped off the call and I, I noticed, ah, he wanted to tell me, so then I jumped back on. So. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, um, <laughs> I know, I was like, literally just I said it, you left. Um, no, I was just going to say, so I, from my perspective, I thought that Jerry passed the ball to you to just um, moderate the call in his absence, and uh, you did a great job, <laughs> so that's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, to kind of and to kind of add on to the the last topic here, um, I feel like there's like a I've noticed a pattern, and I feel like there's almost like a forcing function on both sides. So a group starts, um, it starts off very conversationally based, right? So I feel like Kinko Lab, in some ways, OGM, uh, Clubhouse rooms like Systems Innovators on Clubhouse it starts off just as having conversations. And then after, so, and if, if new people are constantly kind of cycling in, it, it's very natural that that conversation and that kind of style can kind of continue because like new faces are coming in. And so, you know, it's, you're, you're constantly kind of wanting to, you know, continue sharing and updating people and, um, you know, redoing the introductions. And kind of what I found is like after a certain point where the almost the the number of people in the group and the, the faces kind of like levels off, then I feel like there's this natural like sense to like, maybe we should be doing something more, right? So it's like we've had, you know, all these conversations. And if we're having the same conversations amongst the same group of people, then there's this kind of, I don't know, natural sense that I've got that people are like, they want to do something about the conversation, about the things that we talk about. And then it's like, okay, how do we change the call to be able to get more stuff done, to be able to create some sort of impact. And, and then the further in that direction it goes, then you start to like lose people that were coming to the call just to socialize. And so, yeah, I'm kind of just reflecting on that now that there's this pattern of like people come to these calls probably mostly for the socialization aspect and we're all talking about like pretty weighty issues and we all want to actually be the change that or be a part of the change we want to see in the world and then I feel like it might be a mistake to turn the call into something else when we should just be adding on top of it but I feel like because everyone is in a rhythm and everyone is showing up at that time, I think there's a, a natural tendency to say, let's just turn this call and the energy here into something else. Like, you know, transmutate the energy into some other form. 
because the energy is already here. Whereas I feel like the better way to do it is to take the energy and then kind of throw people on a diving board and say, okay, now take the deep dive and pick which pool you're jumping into. And what would that look like if we do that? What would be an example of how that could work? Because uh, we can't, we can't do, um, we can't be on a diving board. So what is the exact thing that we I think it's do? doing other, I think it's having other calls outside of these, like having not just one call a week that we're trying to do like uh, everything. Um, it's having, it's spinning off other smaller groups and calls, which with, o, within OGM has worked like the free, uh, Jerry's brain group, like very focused on software. People go in and aren't willing to dive in and talk about software and get things done. Then, you know, they, they're not going to come. And so there's a natural kind of filtering there. And, you know, and then I feel like the flotilla Friday group spun off and we're like just talking about platforms and like interoperability and so that that stuff is already happening okay um mm. but, but yeah i think i think it needs to be sorry go ahead well, vincent vincent to your point what i'm what i'm reflecting on is a um a classic systems thinking phrase the purpose of a system is what it does and the, the idea is yeah. it's not it's not what you designed it to do, it's what it actually does. And this system is filtering for the people who want to get together to try to solve big problems. And and you can see it because that's who showed up, and that's who keeps showing up week after week. And the people who want to get together just to hang out and have a little bit of creative stimulation from other people's projects, those people have stopped showing up. And so the purpose of a system is what it's actually doing. And so the system is, is saying, this is what this group is. And the other people are, are, are naturally being filtered out. And so I don't think it's, it's good or bad. I think it just is, and we have to decide Okay, is that what it is now? Or should that be a separate call? Because this is trying to become, well, maybe there's a, a little bit of a nostalgia for what it was and, and now it's something different. And so, okay, well, it's something different. And if you want the other thing, then um you know maybe that has to be recreated so that that's kind of my thought on it is that just looking at who's showing up i believe that is what it what it has become it's 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 a sense of what's going on it's still an assumption right scott we can't know for sure that that's the case correct we can't know, correct. That, it's, we can't know that it it's filtering out because of that's like we try to grasp it but i'm, I'm not sure well, it, it's assuming that anyone who wants to be part of this call knows about it. And what I what I think has happened is that that the people who knew about the call have been filtered based on on those two things. But they're the new people, there's just not many. Okay. I, I, I want to name another level in what's going on, uh, maybe is there's like this theory of the four stages of, of social groups and social dynamics. At first, when you come in a, in a new group, you completely adapt to the surroundings and you try to do the, the things that ask from you, like if it's in a workshop setting or anything, like you're really trying to really be as well adapted to the situation as you can um, individually. Um, and then maybe at a certain moment, there is a conflict erupting and then, and then you find a new level. I, I don't know the theory well enough to say the levels, but it's like there's different levels of adapting and there's different levels of challenge in the system. And the end result, what you like to reach is like growth together. But there's also a phase of conflict there. And there's a, and there's a new level of adaptation after conflict. And um, after adaptation there's growth together and that's actually like you can really express yourself 
in your in your deepest sense and in your deepest sense of honesty and somehow i guess there's been conflict coming up but it's not always seen as conflict or it's not always seen as um It's like people have different opinions on, on how to tackle the biggest world issues and maybe there's different views and sometimes it seems like a conflict but i don't see it necessarily as a conflict because everyone's doing their work and they're focusing on something huge but as ogm it's not that clear what it what it can be if it's everything all together and then it's normal that these kind of conflicts come up and that we maybe want to evolve into a next step but how do you hold the conflict in a way that it doesn't take down the energy of the group because the conflicts need to be there i think in a way and how to be supportive for conflict or something i don't know what or what the question is or what the result is and if my expose was clear <laughs> um i i heard someone say it this way that that we, you know, we're, we're thinking of conflict as two fists. And if you instead think of it as a rock and a flint, mm. you, can, you can make sparks and create a fire. Yeah. Which is helpful. And it's, it's approaching this as a tool rather than an obstacle. And I think that's when that's, that's what I'm noticing. I, I agree, and I haven't seen that many people doing it in a in a way that really uh, holds the conflict in a good way. Like I, during this call, I try to just give attention to different, like um, moderate it in a way that everybody's heard, but still the deeper underlying things for me that's really difficult to get hold of. Like what's really going on here in the conversation? When somebody's saying, "Oh, the food system is the most important." place to tackle and we should tackle it on a hierarchical level or at a corporate level and the problem is that it's hierarchy and then somebody else is saying yeah but I think we I, I want to advise the public those are really two very valid ways of working with the issues and they can exist next to each other but somehow it kind of seems to turn into a conflict how do we not make this a conflict how do we do it like that it becomes flint and how do we how do we make constructive conflict also in the term like and if i've seen i don't know is it it's i'm, I'm trying to figure out what it is really well the, the conflict to me has has been in deciding where to spend your time mm -hmm. i haven't heard anyone say at least not openly you know Food systems. Don't don't worry about that. You should work on this instead, um, or or local funding for minority businesses. You shouldn't work on that. You should work on this instead. No one is saying, don't work on that. What we're bumping into, I think, is you have time and resources, each one of us individually, that are limited, and so we're all working on the things that we want to work on, and it feels like. A lot of these conversations are softly convincing other people this is what you should be working on in like 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 help come come and help me work on this. You know, I think you're what you're doing is great, but what I'm looking for is people to help me work on my thing. And and I it's I I don't I'm trying to articulate this, but it feels like it's not saying that's a bad idea or that idea needs to be improved. It's, it's more about trying to pick the thing to work on. And, you know, someone like Vincent or Klaus have gone ahead and said, this is my thing. This is what I'm working on. And mm -hmm. if anybody wants to come along, that's great. And if you don't, I'm still going to work on it. I'm not going to work on your thing. I'm working on my thing. And I will tell you about it every week, but I'm not going to stop working on food systems to go work on another problem. I'm building a, 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 you know, an infrastructure for information. I'm not doing that. And I think that that's being clear about the conflicts that we're having and the, the purposes of getting together. It's really 
it's really the conflict of, of a toddler that you're trying to get to come along with you. You know, you're you're going and they're coming with you or they're not, but they're they're kind of, you know, they're dragging their feet and you just you let them go, but you're not going to change your direction because someone's causing trouble um, or doesn't want to go with you. And I think that's what is what is the best form of our conflict. And maybe it's when Doug says, hey, I think we should be operating in the middle level because, you know, everybody's operating at these two levels. And then we, we discuss that and we say, hmm, I, I wonder where the best level is. And then we take that back to our own thing. But I, I just, um, I think we don't know what we're arguing about or we're not clear about that. So that's why we get together and we say, hey, we're all trying to decide the one thing that we do. And no, we won't. But maybe I can make your thing a little better. Maybe you can make my thing a little better. And maybe we'll even go away and, and work together a little bit. But well, yeah, I think, not, yeah. I think having the conversation helps us figure out what we do individually, <laughs> maybe not collectively. Right, like seeing yeah, what other people are working on and sharing, right, is like gives us clarity. And also like, you know, the feedback I've gotten that's like this piece that you're doing is like in the right direction, the right path. Then it kind of gives you some some feedback to like, you know, continue working on that piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have to run in a minute. Mm I agree with that, Vincent. That that to me is the value is in the random things that people say. This to me is exposure to the new, because you're all working on things I'm not working on, and you're going to yep. say something, and I'm going to say, "Oh, that's great! Wow, I can use that for my thing." <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. But I, yeah, another yeah. It, another level I would like to name because. I think it might be important is to kind of like what's the feeling tone of people entering the room and how they talk the feeling tone meaning like aside from their message also like underlying how they're really feeling about stuff and how are they how are we then feeling as a group there's something about that that i'm not really clear about because it seems to have shifted there were, was more lightness before now there seems to be more heaviness kind of well, it to, to my point earlier, anytime you want to get something done, <laughs> it gets heavier. <laughs> it just automatically gets heavier. You're interacting with the real world and real systems. And, you know, you're not just talking because you can talk and debate all the time. But once you, you really want to do something, now it, it gets heavy because people are asking you to commit time, energy, resources that are finite or work against things. And it's just hard. It's hard to make make things change. There's momentum. Um, yeah, so there, I, I guess there is a part of trying to figure out by yourself. And then right. see you later, Vincent. <laughs> so, <laughs> Take care, Scott. Yeah, later. Bye, Talk to you guys later. See you later. Yeah, um, so I, I don't know. I mean, there's there's joy in getting getting around and just talking about stuff, um, which I think you seem to enjoy. As as people say things, you you will you will question it, you will you will step back, you will reframe it, you know, and that's it, that's interesting. It, it it's a bit deeper, uh, in the sense that what I try to do today by doing the introductions, I really try to understand who are the people here and what does this dynamic need. I already had maybe I was working on the same question and already, like what came in the end of the call is kind of. My own way in is like, who who is this group of OGM people? Who are they really? What is this dynamic? What is the basic dynamic of this group? What is try? What's the driving force? And I'm I'm like, hmm. There's something that becomes not clear, and it's almost in my heart. I feel like a heart thing there going on, which I can't figure out. And, and, and it becomes more heavy when doing, I agree to that. But doing can also be very happy and uplifting and upbeat. So there's something about what makes it 
heavy or not. You can work on global issues that are very heavy and still remain okay with it. I, I talked to um, John Marx, I think his name is, like he's a, he's a, he built one of the biggest peace networks in the world and he, he never takes anything personal. That's one of his rules. And that's how he was able to deal with the heaviest conflicts in the world. So he's de dealing with the heaviest stuff, but he's, he's found a way not to make it too personal and too heavy for him. And I brought in, so I'm trying to tackle that part of it. I think it's good. You can talk lightly about the heaviest topics and it's fun. It's inspiring. You can also talk really heavily about the heaviest talk topics and then it's heavy. <laughs> I'm not sure where the difference lies yet. And, and, and I take in your point. So it's not that I try to um, tell you what you're saying is not valuable because I, I like what you no, say. That's, that's not what I'm saying is that you, I, I feel like you are a, uh, in a lot of ways, yes and, yes and, mm -hmm. and you enjoy exploring those things. And the, the, the challenge I'm feeling is that if I'm in a kayak by myself, I can row, I'm doing, but I can go in any direction and I can change direction at any time. But if we're rowing together in a craft, we all have to be pointed, have to agree that we're going to go in, in, in a direction. And I, I, yeah. I think that that's not the nature of this group. Um, there's no, there's, yeah. yeah. Well, do you, uh, have you ever heard of Emily Wapnick and uh, multipotentialites? Uh, she's talking about people who have different kind of interests and they swap around a lot in life. They have like different career paths developing over different years. Um, and she's, she, she then, in something called re renaissance business and it's about bringing together all your interests in one business and what do you find a common interest and i kind of cherry comes from a background of uh tech tech innovation it seems that yeah. seems to be his main focus and but there's a lot of people coming into this group are really social change focused people and also facilitation focused people and working with corporations directly. So it's less tech focused. Um, so to say this is a group about tech and that's the overarching theme, no. Is it about how to deal with knowledge in a large sphere? Yes, but still it's like, it's like so fuzzy in a way, like uh, knowledge goes in all directions. So it's, so then, so then what? Because we're not trying to figure out what Freeze Jerry's brain is going to look like. We're being there as a group. So what's our common focus as a group? What's our common question? Do we have a question that could carry us? And my fear with all of this trying to find solutions is that they come from the head too much and not really connect people. Like I, I think the basic element of what Jerry is doing is connecting on a hard level kind of thing as well. And how do we how do we bridge this kind of wanting a direction, which is more like trying to figure out and this hard level, what what could meet that place is kind of a question I have. If that makes sense to you. Uh, it it does. There in in part of my recent classes, one of the things they talked about was vision as a destination, not mm -hmm. as a, as a, uh, an ongoing thing. So it's a place you're headed in a sense. And the idea that you can have in an organization, this was organizational vision, mm -hmm. that you can have as many different why as people in the organization, mm -hmm. but you need to have one vision. So we are headed to this place. Why are we going there? Well, because I think it's interesting, because this is my future career, because I want to make some money, 
because I am trying to publish something and this will help me. There's yeah. all different reasons, it doesn't matter. But the place you're going has to be defined. And I think we, uh, we're all in the car together. We're all on the bus together. Yeah. And we're talking, but, but you know, we're looking up at the driver saying, where are we going again? Or, the, or maybe, no, the driver is turning back to us and saying, where are you headed? Mm -hmm. And we're all saying, oh, well, we need to go to the, we need to go to the agriculture place, or we need to go here, or we need to go there. And then, so the driver keeps driving in circles because we haven't yeah. said go here. We kind of have like a bus that acts like a taxi, this kind of thing. <laughs> yes. We've got yeah, like a exactly. bus that tries to act like a taxi and, and there's no way that, and then we're trying to figure out how are, how are we, we a bus together? How do we make this bus right yeah. meaningful or something? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> it's meaningful enough because here, here's the other thing about the purpose of a system is what it does. We keep coming back because we apparently don't mind being in the bus talking even though we're we're driving in a circle mm. you know we, yeah. it's okay well we're we're driving in a circle we haven't picked which direction we're going yet but we don't mind just just talking and yeah and my issue is that there's a disconnect with in the intangible and the mind or i'm not sure even how to call this like uh there's this underlying thing the whole time. I think one of the things, maybe I can name this like my own uh, feeling about the world and about my own personal life hasn't been easy. And I came in the calls and I kind of like being in the calls and I also find it challenging because it's so much information and people have so many different ways of thinking and. And now I'm coming to a level where I actually can digest it better and I can start listening and really coming down. And now I, now I calm down, I notice, oh, something's happening in this group. <laughs> like, hmm, interesting. Um, and um, like last week, I brought in a piece about um, mental health. And I know that it's kind of essential as a piece, but it's maybe not the right timing for it to do it. Um, but it's, and I also think it's a too deep a dive to go there. And I was talking after the call, which I I love the conversation, but still it's not what the group needs, it seems. That's my, my feeling is saying. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what does the group need? I think the group does need upbeatness. It needs some kind of inspiring thing indeed, like, but then if I see all these different things that people are working on, what is the thing that could hold all of it? Um, huh. Well, it, it, does it feel to you a little like a co-working space? Mm, well, interestingly, um, it's both. No, wait, I, I don't know how to explain this. Um, I'll have to go. Yeah. So what I notice is the, the kind of conversation that's going on is open and soft in a way. People are open and soft with each other. Yeah. Um, in a co-working space, often it's heady and busy, and people are trying to really strongly convince you of what they're doing. So I was in this co-working space before, and the first conversation what you have is, oh, what are you doing? And then the person answers to me, yes, we are building this tool for doing this and that, and it's about yes, and we are, and it, it ends up in a level, like it's a very busy mind thing. And people are really like activated in a way that for me in the end doesn't feel pleasant at all. And I noticed it most when a group of philosophers and, act, uh, and, um, and artists entered the space for an evening activity and they had the space for themselves. And I felt the space completely calming down. It was like easy and simple. And 
and open and, and I love that space. And I think Jerry has kind of a balance of those different elements and it makes it so tricky as well. Because in that balance, it's not something you can actually define clearly. So I think that's also part of the space is that he, um, he tries to balance giving people space to speak, but he also names things in such a way he affirms in a positive way. He, like whenever someone finished speaking, he gives associations and, and in that way, affirming and giving value to what a person has been saying. And underlying, I think people kind of want this kind of value from the conversation. They want to be seen and heard in what they're really doing. So I think that's a fundamental meaning of what's going on. But if you would ask them directly, I don't know if people mm. acknowledge it. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. I, I agree. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's, uh, there's also power in telling things like that to people who you're not very close to. You know, like it's, if, you, yeah. if you're gonna share some idea that you're not quite sure about, it's easier sometimes with people that you don't really know very well than it is with someone who, who's very close to you because if they reject the idea, then it's, it's harder, it's harder to hear. Yeah, um, so, yeah. So a lower level or a sub level is okay. We have to deal. With, we are dealing with a group of people with a lot of insecurities, and they're not sharing them directly. You can hear it kind of in their in their tone of conviction about some things. I guess, like, oh, I really want this to happen. I see so much value in it, and so I have to talk with more conviction about what I'm doing. But I think most of the people are talking quite calmly about stuff. So it's that's nice. But when does it shift in the moments that, when do people start bumping into each other? I'm not sure. It's also me, by the way. I notice in the call, sometimes I bump into the conversation. Like, uh, my question is indeed then like, where is this heading? What are we really doing and what, what do we want? I try to grasp what's there, but it's impossible to grasp what's there because it's so, it's on so many la layers at the same time as well, I don't know. Do you think that, that when Plato and Socrates were sitting out on the steps in the, in the courtyard and people were sitting around and they were talking, were they, you know, what was there, was there a focus on what, what this is, should be, what, what are we doing here? You know, all of that. Well, I think, it? yeah, I think if you suppose that Jerry is Plato then, then I think Jerry does have a aim and something he wants to do in life. He wants to get somewhere, what, what is yeah. human. Yeah. But he wants to turn this into, into a viable, you know, a viable thing with an income stream for some people who are able to to make this their work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, uh -huh. and well, and I wonder how many of us see one of the things I don't know. Um, what's his name? Um, Bentley. Bentley is working on this software. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear people saying that all the time. I'm doing this project now. And I'm thinking, is that something you're doing in your spare time? Or is that your job? Or, or you know, like what I don't understand is... Well, startups often don't have an income in the beginning. Well, so well yes, but, but, but still, is that their... Is that their thing or is that a side project? Because, you know, I... You know, I just wonder how many, for me to help someone else, I would have to, to stop my job or stop my personal projects and put their personal projects in place. Hmm. And most of my day is spent doing my work, like my paid for work, graphic design stuff that I do. 
And then there's this little time that I have that I can work on my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And when someone is saying, you know, we really need to work on this big problem, I think, mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't care about it enough or, or it's too big or that feels like, well, that's what I would be doing for the next 10 years. Yeah, but then, I don't want to do that for the next 10 years. I don't want to do their thing for the next. Yeah, but of course, but I don't think people are not literally inviting you to do their project. They are just no. convinced of what they're doing and that that matters. I also hear certain people repeating the same kind of conversation over different weeks. Uh, it's It's about mainly the same topic. And that's really going on for them. And I like it that they get the, so part of me likes that they get like a form for what they're doing. And even so, if it's like repetition, it doesn't really matter because it's about them and what they're doing yes. and they yes. can be heard. And that's the cafe yes. kind of part, yeah. What, what I noticed, and I was telling another group about this, I think I mentioned this to you as well at one point, well, I'm not sure, was that, I have my vision, my vision. And when I say it, I'm thinking about it as I'm saying it. And I'm changing it just a little bit when I say it to you. And then when I say it to Vincent. And then in two weeks from now, Eric comes back and he says, hey, could you tell us a little about yourself? And I say it again, but it's a little different. And what I'm doing is I'm evolving my message i'm evolving my vision and what i realized was that if i am in a room by myself and say my vision out loud it doesn't do the same thing I don't know. but if there's another person it, it it forces me to think about what i'm saying and, and the vision changes it gets a little better it gets a little better i hear klaus he can say his vision now so fast, yeah. so clearly. And before it, it used to take him 20 minutes to try to say it. And now he's just, he's got it because he's been saying it over and over. And he's faster, he's clearer, it's more concise. He knows more what he wants. And I think that to me is a lot of the value of people every week doing their little check-in. and every couple months having to explain who they are and what they're interested in. I think it's that, about, yeah, it's, it's, it is about them, to your point. Yeah, and it's about me. When I when I talk about my stuff, I yeah. want to be hear, heard from me. And I'm trying to balance also like, okay, then how do I bring in value for other people? So I'm trying to also do that. So let's say it in a way that somebody else might have something. Um, so I'm trying to, estimate what parts can I name that are interesting enough for the group to hear and I wonder how other people do that but that's not really the point I think it's more about okay I'm sharing my stuff I'm trying to make it interesting for the group and for me I notice it's short to really make a significant difference for me um, if, if I share about my stuff I'd like to go much deeper even with what I'm working on. Um, yes. And it doesn't mean that the check-ins are bad. It's just that I have a deeper need than just doing check-ins as well. Yeah. Um, and and at the same time, I notice oof, it's so difficult to convey so many different parts of what I'm working on. Like somebody else told, I, I heard through somebody else that somebody said about me in the call, oh, Eric, he's doing everything. <laughs> like, yeah. How people look at me then. And I'm kind of understanding that they're saying this about me. And I can hear it from the perspective of, hmm, okay. So I'm, I'm a bit vague and wishy-washy in my explanations and people don't really get a sense of what I'm about. So they say, that I'm very general. So that's that's one voice speaking and another voice is like, yeah, but that's actually true. I am working on the largest scale and on a bigger vision and 
that for me matters. And that's also the reason why I come to these OGM calls is because I have this vision, I meet other people with similar kind of visions. So there is a voice in me already kind of a bit afraid of how will people look at me? How will people see me in my wildness in, in what I'm doing? And then when I said like, yeah, give me $300,000 and I will change the world profoundly then people are really appreciative up after and that's nice to notice this kind of atmosphere mm -hmm. and i don't know what she... i wonder if because jerry is difficult he also maybe getting money for what he's doing if that also seeps into the call and maybe for different people as well there's this built-up frustration of not being able to make a living with this mm -hmm. Um, and that there's this tiredness growing in com combined with COVID tiredness, like it's going on for a long time now. <laughs> so that's not easy either. And then there's this thing about, uh, I want meaning and I want this to mean something for me, but I think, oh, so then if I look at the level of people just contributing and just doing this small check-in, being kind of like being in the bar together after a long work weekend. It's people from different jobs, but there's this this pub where everything everyone meets every week. That's kind of nice to relax and relieve a bit, but then there's there's this two opposite tension fields which are really interesting in a way, like the, the, the wanting to get things done and wanting to be heard and wanting to be received in a hard space there again. I don't know. I'm rehashing also now, it seems like I'm not really getting further, but it's helping me to name these things to get a clearer picture on what makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder how many people in the call are struggling with what they're doing and struggling heavily. Like in a way, the heaviness could be of like what you named. Uh, like it's heavy stuff, it's wicked problems, they don't solve easily. Do we need to name our feelings about it? Do we need to bring it into the space? Like, oh, I'm really struggling here. I've been doing this project for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. I haven't made much progress, da 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 da. Or is that gonna make the space more heavy even? I don't think it will. Actually, I think it's an interesting idea um, because at that point, you're looking for validation, you're looking for encouragement, you're looking for um, pe other people to say, I've been working on a problem myself for five years. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is what I had experienced in co-working. It wasn't a startup incubator. Yeah. It was a it was a co-working space, meaning we were all working on our own things, our own companies, but just at separate desks in one big room. And it was the it was being among and with other people. And sometimes you would talk about, hey, I'm going to lunch. Where do you recommend? And sometimes you would ask. So what is it that you work on? And so, you know, it, it was just, it, you never knew what it was about, but it was, it was always, you know, it was just being in a space with, with other people. Um, How did you feel in that space? I, I welcomed it, it was good because I could go there and not necessarily talk to anyone, but I could hear other people talking or I could engage with people and it was just nice to, there's a difference when you're working at home and you're, you're slogging away on things. And if you're working in a space like that, oh, there's other people who are also working away by themselves, you know, struggling with their own things. I, I had read a, a little story this morning about a guy who was writing a book by himself at home for five years. And he didn't know any other writers. He didn't 
It wasn't a subject his family was interested in. And, you know, he, he had another job, but he was just something he was working on. And he got, he ended up getting, the, the story went, he ended up getting a, a key to a room in the back of the New York Public Library. And there were only a dozen keys because there were a dozen desks. And they were given out to special people. And so they were authors who were working on things. And he would go back to this room and there was 12 desks and there was 12 somewhat notable people working on their own projects. And this guy came in there, he was, he was still in awe of some of the people who happened to be there. And they asked him, one of them asked him, well, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this book. How long have you been working on it? And he said, uh, five years. And the other person said, oh, it took me nine years to write this one. Yes. And then another person asked him the same question and, and they had, this was later on and they said, oh yeah, yeah, it was seven years for me. And it gave him hope because he thought five years was maybe too long. Like he had crossed over and he would never finish. And hearing those stories, he realized, oh, you know, I, I still have another couple couple years maybe in this, but but there's an end. And yeah. and it was inspiring just to talk to someone and hear their own experience. I noticed this is my reality right now. Um, coming into the OGM group was kind of on an edge of like, I need other people doing this because I can't bear it anymore. Then yes. I meet people doing the same thing, but it's still challenging because it's so many ideas <laughs> and so many different approaches. And like, ooh, if, if I look at what I'm doing, am I doing the right thing? Or maybe I have to do so much more research and it will prove that my idea is not worth it. Or <laughs> yeah. and the other idea is like, oh, maybe I will fuck up. And it's kind of like all these feelings and emotions came together. And then my personal life was getting challenging also, or it's, it's, it's been challenging for a while, a little bit. I think there's something about that, like my own feeling of heaviness. I think I, I might also bring it in the call myself, which I'm not, it's not a guilt thing, but more like an awareness thing. And um, so I'm like, I imagine other people having a similar thing and I know some people have it. Like how, how do we do this as OGM? Um, I like it, like I noticed when you give a bit of perspective then it changes the mood a bit, but it was just a bit in that moment, I think as well. You know, when you named, um, these are wicked problems, we don't solve it that easily. So we're all working on our own thing. Then you gave like a perspective that lightens the atmosphere a bit. And I think if if anything we can do for, um, for OGM, I wonder like you could say, yeah, find the, find the right goal that we can cross together, but it could also be this heaviness management. I wonder like just trying to be atmosphere managers um, is another part of it. I would say. I agree that Jerry has a gift in that he knows when the when the group wants to be heavier and when the group wants to be lighter. Mm -hmm. His his facilitation skills are excellent that way. Um, yeah, and today I wasn't prepared at all. I think I would have, if I would have prepared it, then I would have approached it in a way that I, I tried to bring really value for everyone in the call. Right now, I just was curious in introductions and I wanted for, Send us yeah. introductions, and I hoped it would have lasted 20 minutes, but then it lasted an hour or something what? with a conversation of food systems in between. <laughs> yeah, no, no one is no one is faulting you for that at all. No, 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 I know. But I'm yeah. also so I'm not feeling guilty, but I'm more like trying to figure out what does the group need. That's my mm -hmm. interest. And I could feel it during the call as well. Like, what does this group really need? And that's, I think that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Because 
it, it, it relates to who's showing up and who keeps showing up. Well, they're getting something that they need. Yeah, but it's also shifting. I mean, I, I see if, if I see the last calls that I've been on, it's been different people that show up. It's not the same every week. Some people like you, it's been a while. Me yeah. also in a certain moment it was a while and now I'm back. So well I I uh I went away for a while because I wasn't getting what I needed out of it. It was it was something that my brain was filled with other people's problems after every call. And during a time <laughs> when when we were all quarantined, that was okay. It was kind of fun. It was a distraction. It was like watching a, a spy movie where the world is ending, but it's not it's not your problem to solve. You can watch them try to struggle with it. And um, when I noticed, I so I, I took some time and went away from it. And even just watching the emails, I thought those it's it's waking up all these little areas that I don't really want to care about because I don't have the space. I'm trying to solve problems that are my own. Mm -hmm. And I did just didn't have the space for it. Um, because like you, I think they all sound interesting. Oh yeah, okay, you want to talk about that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it's like all oh, this 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 my part of my brain is now full of of all these ideas. And and it just took me off of my uh, well, I believe in incubation as a creative tool, but incubation is best when you load it up with relevant stuff and then, you know, you sleep and you wake and you sleep and you wake and over time things develop. And I had all these things that weren't helping. Mm. I needed to not listen to the other people's problems that way. Yeah, but I, I had a similar thing. Like when I say it's mentally overwhelming, it's also kind of listening to intense topics in a way. Like food system collapse, blah. <laughs> That's like a, if I think about it, I can get just completely depressed if I don't watch out. But it's also a, a, a high level thought exercise, which I can find interesting or not. and. It's something about it, I'm not sure. Some people are easier with holding a lot of different ideas at the same time, and they can switch easily from one another. I think Jerry himself can do it more easily than me, for instance. Um, but I, I also see, think that there's a whole group of people and they might have similar experiences because I share with you with filled with other people's problems. It's kind of, it's not their personal problems, but it's, what they're in their work, what they're struggling with in their work and what you're trying to figure out. So, and it's the same for me. I was full, like after a convers, like after an OGM call, I couldn't sleep or something uh, before. And now it seems like, mm, I, I start to find another approach and my brain starts to better digest it in a way. That's also because I take more space and I don't work that much on what I'm working on, but it's, it is though, in a way, a group of very similar people that would want very, very similar things in a way, because their, their approach is very different, but somehow they might also want, like it's this, this camaraderie on working on the same level. And some one part of it is that it's like a recurring thing in workshops often is, oh, this is the way to solve it. This is the way to solve the biggest problems. Like the silver bullet thing, I've, I've noticed that in, um, in other conferences and workshops that that's something I wanna avoid, but I don't necessarily know how to avoid it, how to say, yeah, let's, Maybe it's easy just to say, yeah, we're working on different levels and different approaches, but I think all our approaches are worth pursuing or something because we're working on a level that matters. All of us, all of our work matters and it's very different. So we might not agree, but it still matters, all of it. 
kind of this thing, but yeah. Uh, I'm going for dinner. I'm going to prepare myself some dinner. <laughs> uh, for you, it's noon, I guess. Ah, uh, your uh, mic is muted. Yeah. Uh, one thirty. So just about. Yeah. It's so. Fast. Okay. Thank, thanks, Scott, for digesting a bit uh, together with me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And uh, see you next time. I'll see you later. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 Be well. Have a good week. You too.